Hello folks, the Nasdaq falls but Soundhound shrugs it off, rising 6% on the day and Soundhound is now one of the hottest stocks on the market. Not only are retail traders in love with Soundhound, Wall Street is too, with some top analysts recently upgrading their forecasts. In this video, I'll go over these recent upgrades to Soundhound's valuation, today's price action, institutions buying Soundhound, and my game plan or forecasts for next week. Strap yourselves in because it's going to be an info-packed video. Before we begin, most of you are not subscribed yet, so please hit that like and subscribe button to get instant updates when I post sound and videos. And also, I'm not a financial advisor, so I take all my content with a grain of salt and see professional financial advice if you need to. First, let's talk about analyst upgrades to Soundhound's share price. Dan Ives is one of the most prominent tech analysts on Wall Street, and he's renowned for making huge calls on stocks like Apple. He's been covering Soundhound since last year, and he recently upgraded his price target just after the latest earnings report from $5 to $9. Look at his profile on tipranks.com, which is a site that tracks Wall Street analysts' performance. He's one of the highest ranked analysts and regularly appears on CNBC and Bloomberg, to express his views. Gil Luria is a senior technology analyst who's ranked even higher on tip ranks and his average strike rate and returns are staggering. Luria initiated his coverage of Soundhound in September last year with a $5 price target. He then upgraded it to $7.50 two weeks ago and just yesterday he upgraded it yet again to $9.50. Both of these analysts were interviewed in this CNBC video two weeks ago. They're talking about Apple in this one, but pay attention to what they're saying because it directly relates to Soundhound. I've skipped over some stuff to make it more concise. Investors want to see them focused all in on AI. So I think this was something that has been a painful period going through in terms of uh, starts and stops on the EV initiatives. But I think the writing was in the wall. The smart move for Cook and Cupertino focus all in on AI. And I think it's a step forward and puts this chapter in the past. And then I want to build on what Dan said about AI. What we need to hear from them isn't just incremental things like photo touch-ups and autocomplete in text. What we want to hear is uh, about an assistant. I want to be able to say, hey, Apple Assistant, Book me a restaurant tomorrow night with my boys near the concert venue at around seven o'clock. And it can do that. And Apple is uniquely positioned to do that. And to, to Dan's point, it needs to be tied to the iPhone 16. If that can run on previous versions of the iPhone, it will be hard for them to get a big upgrade cycle from iPhone 16. So those are the kinds of things we're going to be looking for. As you can see, they want companies like Apple to invest in AI technologies, not hardware. And notice how Gilarius says Apple should develop a co-pilot with voice AI capabilities. Well, guess who has that technology? Yep, Soundhound. And last time I checked, Apple had a cash war chest of over $70 billion. I think you know where I'm going with this one. But I think Soundhound needs to really build out its client base a bit further before mega caps like Apple take notice. Give it a few more quarters and things could get real spicy. So Wall Street likes Soundhound and so do we. We like the stock. Anyway, moving on to today's price action. It was a bit quieter than yesterday, but I think it was due to weakness in the tech sector, with stocks like Palantir tumbling nearly 4% and the Nasdaq down over 1%. By the way, I mentioned yesterday that I shorted Nasdaq futures to hedge my stock portfolio, so today I made some money on that hedge. I haven't covered the short yet because I think the market might fall further on Monday and Tuesday before Jerome Powell comes up and juices up the market on Wednesday. Anyway, that's a bit of a sidetrack, but let's get back to Soundhound. It recovered from its gap down in the open with a sustained rally for most of the day that sort of slowed down towards the close as traders exited their positions heading into the weekend. If we zoom out to the weekly chart, it looks like this rally is still on fire. All I can say is the shorts continue to be squeezed and the huge volatility is constantly shaking out the weak holders. And judging by the huge volume and positive price action, I think the stock continues to be accumulated by the hodlers and institutions. Speaking of institutions, let's talk about both passive and active funds. As you can see here, we have passive investors like Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street buying Soundhound. I found it interesting how these big institutions already own a supposed hyped up penny stock like Soundhound, so I dug a bit deeper, and I discovered that many of these passive investors are buying Soundhound because it's part of the Russell 2000 and 3000 indexes. Now, these indexes are market capitalization weighted. In other words, the higher the price of Soundhound gets, the more shares they have to buy. So in effect, these huge passive funds are putting a floor on the share price by continuing to buy 
due to its rising market cap. To better illustrate what I'm saying, look at the performance of Soundhound versus the Russell 2000 over the past month. Basically, IWM has gone nowhere, but Soundhound has more than doubled. So Soundhound's weighting within this index has, well, more than doubled, which means these huge passive funds must now own more than double the amount of Soundhound shares they held last month. So these passive funds are sort of dumb in the sense that they can't decide to buy or sell because they think Soundhound is too cheap or expensive. If Soundhound's market cap goes up, they have no choice but to buy. So where am I going with this? Well, like I said, these passive investors are essentially putting a floor on Soundhound's share price by implicitly supporting it through purchases. These passive funds cannot sell unless the price tanks. So as a shareholder, I have several tailwinds behind my back. Institutional support from passive fund purchases, weak holders continuing to get shaken out daily. I mean, the daily volatility is too much to handle for many traders. Short sellers continuing to get squeezed. And finally, active institutional investors getting in on the action. I see a few of them on the shareholder register and they might increase in number soon as they chase the momentum. So finally, moving on to next week's forecast. I think we might see red to begin with since NASDAQ is continuing to look weak. I think we may see a pullback to $8 on Monday or Tuesday. And on Wednesday, it's going to be really interesting because this guy, Jerome Powell, will be laying down the law in the afternoon with the FOMC rate decision for March. There probably won't be any cut to rates, but his choice of words in the speech afterward will be crucial to gauge what their rate trajectory will be going forward. I think he's just going to kick the can down the road and say something like, inflation's still elevated, we're going to wait for more data, blah blah blah. I think the market will like that, and if nothing from left field comes, it should rise on Thursday and Friday. As for Soundhound, as long as the NASDAQ doesn't crash next week, I think we could see my initial price target of $12 reached on Thursday or Friday. I'll be taking some profits at that price and keep the rest. But as always, this is not a recommendation to buy, hold, or sell the stock, and I may be dead wrong, and I might change my mind at any moment. So you need to formulate your own trading strategy and stick to it. Thanks for watching, and please hit the like and subscribe button, and let me know in the comments if you're still holding Soundhound. Have a good weekend, and see you on Monday.